One thing I wanted to address before we move on to is the issue of stents, because I know that's a hot topic. You could probably give us some insight into stenting. Yes, uh, you know, it's obviously a problem. There's been a, a number of patients that have been in the media recently that have had problems with stents. Mm -hmm. And what I tell patients first and foremost is that stents aren't evil. Um, you shouldn't necessarily say, I absolutely don't want a stent. Mm -hmm. Although that is your right as a patient. Every patient has the right mm -hmm. to tell their practitioner, this is my body, do not put a stent in my body. Right. And, you know, we, in our practice, we have patients who approach us in that manner, and, you know, we will move heaven and earth to get a good result without a stent. Mm -hmm. But having said that, stents are not bad. Um, they were created for a reason, and they're used all the time for a very good reason. Stents were not created for arteries. There's not right. artery-specific stents and necessarily vein-specific stents. There are some stents that are used much more often in arteries, cardiac stents, for instance. In my practice, in our practice in California, we place thousands of stents in veins a year outside of CCSVI. Right. These are the same stents that we put in arteries. Okay? We do these in dialysis interventions, cancer interventions, many other medical conditions. Stents do have a place in treating the venous system. It's done every day, thousands of times per day throughout the world, the United States and Canada. Now, having said that, um, I think it's very important that patients have a frank and earnest discussion about the use of stents in the practice where they're getting treated. When they use stents, how often they use stents, where they would typically place them, why would they place them there, has there been problems with stents, what can be done after a stent has a problem, and you know, the patient should sit down and have this frank discussion with the practitioner to get a level of comfort that if there is a stent that's going to be used, why would it be used in me and where would it be used in me? Right. And what would be the efforts that would be done to make sure that I get a good result without having to have a stent put in me? I would also want to know what experience this practitioner has with using stents in the venous system outside of CCSVI. Mm -hmm. Uh, it may seem simple to just put a, a stent in a vessel, but in all honesty, it's you know you want someone who's done something thousands of times right. so that they understand the subtleties of when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate to do it. Joseph, let me ask a question here. Mm -hmm. um, I was in Glasgow uh, a few weeks ago and uh, heard a number of other interventional people speak, uh, such as Ivo Petrov, for example, Marian Simka. Uh, and, and in the early stages, it seems like when I hear these different people speak, they all do this a little bit differently. And so there are, are some people who have used um, smaller size ballooning, for example, not necessarily stents. Um, there is Marion Simka's group in their paper recently published by Ludiga as the first author, I think, in Phlebology, where they, they comment on their first 300 cases in terms of the safety and the they comment for the most part that it is a safe procedure, as you mentioned earlier, that there are some complications associated with this. They all have slightly different methods of doing this, and the concern raised at, at some of the last meetings has been you know, what size of the balloon should be used. Um, you know, is 8 millimeters enough? Is 10 or 12 enough? Do you have to go higher than this? And, and you know, how, how do you determine that? And then the same would be true for the stents. Depending on where you're putting these stents, uh, since the, the veins are so pliable, one has to worry that if you return blood flow to the system, will the size of that vein now change? Um, I think this is, to me, it's an important question that, at the moment at least, there is no consensus by the interventional radiologist what to do here. And, and you know, we, in the summer, we formed this new society called the International Society for Neurovascular Disease. One of the hopes is we could bring together people like yourself to write a white paper on this and at least present some, as you said, consensus on what's the minimally best way to do this. Because I'm wondering if some of the reasons that the problems we've been seeing in the last six months of people coming back to get rescanned or retreated it is because um, maybe they, they were done suboptimally. And, and how do we get to that level, Joseph? I think you raise a really good point, Mark. Um, in our practice, we see 
perhaps four or five, six patients a week who are returning after previous treatment with a malplaced stent, a stent that's too small, oftentimes resulting in thrombosis. And this, of course, leads us to, to desire this idea of having a more global and uniform standard for the placement of stents in some broad stroke, at least. And this isn't without precedent. For instance, the Society of Interventional Radiology issues um, white papers, as do other societies, as to a minimum standard and general guidelines um, for complications and the way that different um, diseases are treated. I think it would be very appropriate and, and very important in doing this um, to make sure that, you know, that the application of stents and just the application of angioplasty even for patients in terms of, as you mentioned, Mark, balloon sizes, locations, the veins that are looked at, standard criteria for saying, you know, this is this is a good result, or this is not a good result, or this is something that needs to be treated, or, you know, let's talk about anticoagulation. A lot of these different variables that go into the treatment of CCSVI patients today, we could establish a more uniform standard so that practitioners throughout the world, number one, would hopefully help um, achieve a better result with fewer patients that come to practices like mine um, with an unacceptable result from a prior treatment and perhaps to uh, move this body of knowledge forward with a more uniform front so that we can get better acceptance of the practice and uh, perhaps better data that again helps us find those causalities that really make a difference in the treatment. And that's important for the research studies that we've talked about because if two people treat somebody differently it becomes hard to unwrap why one person gets better and the other person doesn't. So having that, that standard where there's at least a minimal agreement on how to do this makes it easier to draw interpretations from this, easier to analyze that data.